Um, I want you to talk about yourself, your channel, uh, and the research you did for the Liberian President Series that brought that made all this information available to you, so people will get to folks will get to know you, get to know your channel, and and uh, and connect with you through that, that way as well. Yes. So of course, I'm Jabari Lamb, and I am part of the BIO. It's the Black African Infrastructure Organization. We're an organization that's dedicated to the principles of land infrastructure nation in Liberia on the continent of Africa. And we are dedicated to strengthening the connection between African Americans and Liberia. And that's through education, that's through history, and that's through collaboration and initiatives. And we want African Americans in the Liberian diaspora to see Liberia as their homeland and also other Afro-Caribbeans because Afro-Caribbeans were just as involved with Liberia as, as African Americans. And we want them to see it as a home because of the historical connection and because of this place in Pan-African thought and Pan-African history that we want to push that because Liberia's history is oftentimes very misinterpreted, is oftentimes mistaught, narratives are wrong, context are, is, is not there. It's just this assumption instead of understanding what caused Liberia, what ideologies led to that, and how Liberia emerged in the way it was. It doesn't factor in foreign interventions. It doesn't factor in the Cold War. So that's what we really do. We really challenge this. We really go in depth with the presidential series. Me, of course, there's a lot, a lot of research that I've done and a lot, a lot of archives. So some stuff that I use is Liberia Info. I use Liberia Past and Present. I use Liberia, I use the American Colonization Society, so they have the African repository, some stuff that you can look up. There are books from, of course, you know, the great historian, uh, Dr. Patrick Burroughs. He does a good job on that. You have books that were written by scholars in the 1980s. We have the Maryland Colonization Journal. That's stuff you can get that's been digitized and you, and you can look over. There's some stuff of the Liberian Herald. You can look at where I get information about these presidents, legislated legislation that had been written that, that you can get books like online, the political economy book you can get online. I had to, it took me a long time to, to get it, but uh, eventually I, I got the, the copy of the book and um so that that's where I get all of my information and that's why I really put them together in a presidential series that people can sort of get information about because when you go on YouTube, there's no, you can't really find any information on these presidents. If you type in a president's name with maybe the exception of Joseph Jenkins Roberts and William B. S. Tubman and William Tolbert, the recent presidents, you're not going to get anything. You're not going to get information on W.T. Gibson, Garrett W. Gibson. You're not going to get information on William Coleman. You're not going to get information on Hillary R. W. Johnson, Alfred Francis Russell. You're not going to get none of that. You're not going to get them on the vice presidents, J.J. Johnson. You're not going to get it on uh, D. Somerville. You're not going to get it on Nathan L. Brandier. You're not going to get it on none of that. So you really have to, We, we I felt like I really have to get this information out there because people need to know about them. And if we truly respect ourselves as African Americans, Afro Caribbeans, and Liberians, we have to appreciate the people who who paved the way, and we have to tell our own story, and we have to let the people who made it, it what it is know that we still are continuing their legacy and that they matter. Exactly. So, so who's your number five? So at number five, I'm gonna have William V. S. Tubman. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I have William B.S. Tubman is he is known for the open door policy. He was the one that after Edwin Barclay, he takes into office and he does the open door policy that opens up Liberia for an investment, particularly foreign investment. And that's usually going to come in the form of American investment, but also some Western European country investment. He was the one that encouraged many indigenous people to go from the hinterland, what they what we would call the hinterland back then, now is Nimba, Grangita, Bone County, Lofa, to come to the cities. And he was the one that sort of occurs a sort of change in the status quo in a way in sort of making the indigenous people officially more of it, although indigenous people were being assimilated into the, the power structure, but it wasn't happening fast enough. However, it has to be said that William B. S. Tubman was a dictator. This man killed off opponents. He 
was the one who tried to crush the independent true Whig party. He was the one that allowed for the CIA to spy on other countries in Africa, although he was doing stuff with the Organization of African Unity, speaking out against apartheid. He really didn't address inequality. It was what people term economic growth without development. So you're having one of the fastest growing economies in the world, but people don't have access to toilets, roads are disconnected, clinics are not being built all across the country. It's just really being built in Monrovia, Buchanan, and then his home area in Maryland County in the Harper area, Harper Plebo area. So that's why I have William B.S. Tubman as number five. And I felt like he also could have done better in attracting more African-Americans the way that Kwame Nkrumah was. So Kwame Nkrumah for many African-Americans in today's era is sort of that culmination of Pan-Africanism despite Liberia having that culmination first. And when you see these African-Americans heading to Ghana instead of in Liberia, it sort of shows William V.S. Tubman's failure to really attract that demographic despite the fact that they were still coming the James Baldwin, the Bill Russells, the Maya Angelou's who had originally stayed there and wanted to work for William B.S. Tubman in the interior. Uh, in his Ministry of Interior, you have Nina Simone, you have all of these black celebrities coming there and the Hebrew Israelites who stay in Liberia. Their original plan was to stay in Liberia, but then go to Israel because the Liberian government doesn't adjust. And this is all happening under his reign. And then, of course, I can't forget that William B. S. Tubman, to a certain degree, side-eyed the Nation of Islam, uh, the Black Muslims, from immigrating to the country. So those are all the things that I would have for why I put William B. S. Tubman at number five, and he's not at the top three or the the best president. So that's who I have at number five. Number four. So who's number four? So at number four, I'm going to put... This one was really a, a close one, but if I had to choose, I'm going to choose William Coleman over Hillary R.W. Johnson. So Hillary R.W. Johnson and William Coleman were my battling out between the, the fourth position. And I'm going to put William Coleman because William Coleman was the really the major one that put into practice the idea of one unified Liberian identity. He understood that the interior of Liberia was going to be important for economic development and not coastally. He understood that it was going to be the day, the Mandingos, the Bai, the Gold, all these indigenous people along with the um, americo Liberians, the African-American repatriates that's going to build this country together. He was the one who wanted to expand on Joseph, Joseph James Cheeseman's term and invest in schools. He wanted to work in Liberia College and he was such against the status quo that it ain't really some of the American Liberians wanted him to resign and he did end up resigning from the true Whigs and then he ran as another candidate but he lost as being part of the People's Party. So the fact that he was such a transformative figure that they made him resign is why I would have him over William Coleman. I mean, over Hillary R.W. Johnson, because Hillary R.W. Johnson was a very, very skilled man. Like I said, this was close between him and Hillary R.W. Johnson, because those two, Coleman and Johnson, were extremely gifted, but I would have to put Coleman because of the vision and what he was trying to implement. So that's why I would put him as number four, as the four greatest li uh, uh, of the top five of the greatest Liberian presidents instead of Hillary Johnson. Now, Hillary R.W. Johnson, I would put under Tubman, but he, William Coleman, is going to be at number four. How about number three? At number three, I have James Spriggs Payne. I have James Spriggs Payne. And the major reason why I have James Spriggs Payne is he was unapologetically black. He was a black radical. He believed in working with the indigenous people, just like William Coleman and William B.S. Tubman. But he was signing treaties. 
he continued ba- Daniel Basher Warner when Benjamin K. Anderson went into the Liberian, uh, the interior, the kingdom of Masardu. And he's the one who's really assigning treaties. He's the one that's telling many of the indigenous people who are still practicing slavery that this is not a good idea. An example would be when he was signing a treaty with the kingdom and they were enslaving Buzzies. They were called Buzzies at the time, but we would call them the Loma people uh, today. He wanted them really to get away from that, that slavery, that servitude that was still going on in some of their kingdoms. Because at this time, that, that's not Liberia. What we consider today Liberia is not Liberia. In the 1870s, Liberia was just a sliver of land on the coastline that encompasses Grand Cape Mount, uh, Grand Bassa, Sino, Monterey County, and Maryland County. All the other interior counties that we know today are what would be called province. The central province, the eastern province, the northern province. That's what's going on. So the fact that he's going into territory that he does not exert control over and reaching treaties with these Liberian kings and these Liberian chiefs, you know, coming up with an agreement to work with the Gribo people and, of course, being unapologetically black despite having fairly white skin or being light-skinned to pass for white is important because so often there's this debate between the lighter skins and the darker skins on who's more black and who's this. In reality, James Six Payne may have been really light skin, could have passed as a white man, but he was unapologetic and he was well articulate. And that's why there is a airfield, James Six uh, Payne Airfield named after him, Painesville, Liberia, because of the tremendous amount of work that he did, as well as him going back to America, advocating for for black people to repatriate through the American Colonization Society. Him, of course, being one of the major preachers, being part of the Methodist Church and being involved in that understanding ministry. And, of course, he wrote a book co-authored with Stephen Allen Benson talking about the political economy because he was really involved in politics and was doing partial work in the Declaration of Independence and overseeing the Constitutional Convention. So that's why I got James Strix Payne at number three. So number five is William D.S. Tubman. Number four is William Coleman. Number three is James Strix Payne. Number two is definitely going to be E.J. Roy. E.J. Roy has to be within the top three, simply because he is what many people will refer to as the Lincoln of Liberia. This man was the culmination of vision. He wanted to build a railroad system to the interior, which if that would have happened, would have propelled Liberia into industrialization, into that modernizing and becoming a world power because he, you now have transportation instead of just using horse wagons or carriage and walking, and walking. You actually have the railroad system, which many African countries didn't have. He was the one who wanted to bring in foreign investment. He was the one that wanted to really truly create a pan-African identity. He worked with Edward Wilmot Blyton. He was the one who worked for James Kerry Smith. And he was the one who really gave darker skinned people a voice. Although you have uh, exceptions such as Daniel Bastian Warner, although mixed race, he's dark skinned. Or you have a situation with Stephen Allen Benson where he's a pure Negro. He was the one who people quoted as having the first fully black or dark skinned spouse in, in the presidential mansion at his time. And he was unapologetic in believing that Liberia was destined to be a leader of Africa, of the black race. And he was unapologetic uh, of being proud of being dark skinned, which many of them didn't have. Although there were dark skinned people who were merchants, they were merchants, they were sailors. Nobody did it like E.J. Roy. This man was educated in the United States. He was one of the wealthiest black men in Liberia, so much so that he had his own private shipyard, like his own private ships where he was able to transfer back and forth. And he was so revolutionary and so radical that it led to a coup that they tried to stop on the Republicans well, by trying to implement James Rick's pain, <laughs> surprisingly, and then issue a coup against E.J. Roy, basically almost bringing the country to the point of civil war because the fact that he threatened the established order that had developed in Liberia and the fact that he wanted to really create, understood that all black people are equal regardless, whether or not they are indigenous African captives, whether or not they are light-skinned, 
they all matter and, and you can't create this sort of tier system that's based on colorism that's perpetrating Eurocentric ideology. So that's why EJ Roy is at number two because he was the one who broke it. Now, everybody's going to be waiting for number one. Who is number one? And of course, why? N number one is obviously going to be Joseph Jenkins Roberts. Obviously, he's going to be number one. If, if there is the epitome uh, uh, of greatness, he's going to be number one. Number one, similar to E.J. Roy, he's educated. So this man was educated with well, Colston. He was privately educated. He had access to libraries that many states did not, did not have. He was, of course, the first president. So he really set the standard. He set the tone. He had to challenge Samuel Benedict. Samuel Benedict was one of the most well-known Librarians in the colony, but was tainted because of the, mur the uh, particular involvement in a murder case with a man by the name of Tobias. So that's what sort of tainted him. He was the one who got Liberia recognized first by the UK, then France, and then it, it soon falls to other countries such as Hamburg, which we would consider today modern day Germany. You have Haiti, you have Denmark, you have Sweden, and then in, in, in his successor's term, in Stephen Allen Benson is when the United States can erect. Uh, represented, but he's really going to be the foundation uh, of Liberia, transitioning to a country, being the first lieutenant, black lieutenant governor of the colony, being elected from 1848 to 1846, and then having to come back and stabilize everything after you have E.J. Roy get overthrown, his vice president, James Skivering Smith, stays for two months, and then Joseph Jenkins Roberts has to inherit it from 1872 to 1876. Then he's the one who's going to donate his money to Liberia College. Then he's going to be the one that's going to try to work with the indigenous people, try to create these treaties. And he's the one who has to over really see, with, of course, with James Skibbery Smith, the Grebo War that occurs in 1875 to 1876 that happens. And so when you have that where you are setting the tone, being the first lieutenant governor, black lieutenant governor, then being the first president, then having to set the precedence of how many terms uh, a president is supposed to stay. Then you got to deal with the fact this man lost his wife when he was in his teenage, when he was first immigrating there to then get married to Jane Wayne Roberts. And then, of course, have his other family members, of course, William Colston and others move to the colony and then become successful. They are successful merchants. They are successful working in farming and agriculture. So Joseph Jenkins Roberts really epitomizes the founding of a nation, being that, of course, his parents, his, his mom was a slave and his father was of Welsh origin. And the fact that he was able to come from that and then be the first president and set the standard to me, it's so, so important. And then, of course, he was involved in the army, involved in the militias. So every part of Liberian society was Joseph Jenkins Robert was a part of. And I think that, to me, is why he will always be number one and why I wouldn't put E.J. Roy over Joseph Jenkins Roberts, simply because of the fact that he really set the tone in how Liberia is governed and how... Liberia would function. And he, just like James to explain, he's going to America trying to get support for African Americans to come to Liberia and the American Colonization Society. He's speaking to them. And so that's why he's definitely number one. And of course, he leaves his estate. So Joseph Jenkins Roberts, number one, EJ Roy's number two, James Payne's number three, William Coleman's number four, and then William V.S. Tubman takes the fifth spot. And of all the Past presidents, uh, the legacy of Roberts is still there today. He has a scholarship fund that uh, kids now are still benefiting from, from a long time ago. Knowing that he was part of all of those aspects of what it would take to build a country, to me, is what makes him stand in the pantheon of great, not only Liberian leaders, but African-American leaders and African leaders in general, because he will always be the first president in Africa. No president can claim they are the first president of the entire African continent or in the African continent, but Joseph Jenkins Roberts, because he's the first one who created, Liberia is the first republic, and he's the first president of the first republic. Final question, a uh, statement more or less. A lot of Liberians are going to be sort of disappointed that you left out uh, 
Willem Ara Talbot, though. What's your general view of President Talbot? So, Talbot is a mixed bag. So, to, there's a lot of, of controversies with, with William Talbot. One is he did start to break away from Tubman's uh, um, policies and dictatorship. But at that time, you have a situation where you had the rice riots in 1979. You had the ritual killings in Maryland in, in, the, in the early 1970s. You have a situation where personally you have some accusations that had been heralded against uh, Tober that may or may not have been true. Um, you have a situation where he is trying to progress the country, but at the same time, he's not addressing the core roots of the issue. It's more uh, go incrementally. And at this time, knowing that there's a lot of radical change happening, knowing that all of this is brewing up, I feel that Tolbert d didn't do enough to sort of offstate that coup because there, if he would have done his job, I, I felt like there's no way, uh, of course we cannot, forget the fact that there was foreign intervention in the coup that would lead to Samuel Doe taking power. But just if he would have had a strong backing with the people and also developed a professional military and had developed that security, I think the coup would have never happened. So that's why I don't have William uh, uh, Tolbert being in the top five. I have him in the top 10, but I don't have him in the top five. And he, for me, is at the I would say number eight or nine, because we would have to put, like I said, Hillary R. W. Johnson at six, then Arthur Barclay at number seven, and then I would have to put Stephen Allen Benson at number eight. So nine is where I would put William Tolbert out of everybody, of all the Liberian presidents. Tavari, thank you so much for the knowledge. Thank you for the interest in our history, uh, your history too, and. Uh, it's been such a pleasure talking to you this evening. It's been a pleasure talking to you too.